Coming to you live from the Stream.TV studios in Hollywood, California, Pensado's Place is brought to you by Vintage King, The Blackbird Academy, Avid, Recording Connection, Studio 202, Slate Media Technologies, and Slate Digital, and Audio Technica. You are going to learn the camp concept from one of the very best. We've got updates. We got a lot of stuff, right? Mm -hmm. You're at the place, baby. Pensado's place. What's up, everybody? Glad to have you with us. Uh, Very excited about today for numerous, numerous, numerous reasons. Mm -hmm. Right, HT? Mm -hmm. Um, Does this remind you of anything? Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. It's not an official I, show unless he beats the crap out I of me. I forgot. Damn, my fault. Good, there's good there's some sort of joke there, but I'm I'm not bold yeah. enough to cross <laughs> that line right now. We'll practice it for next <laughs> week. <laughs> Man, you, you catching up on your sleep yet? I'm almost there. Yeah, what's weird is that I have so many questions that I get or emails or texts or whatever. Is, are, is that? Are you back? Have you rested? I was, Have I you? was worried about you for about a month there it was um you know we're here i was in the grocery store the other night and the guy came up and was very gracious and stuff and went he had gone to the, to the awards and his only question was have you recovered <laughs> <laughs> and i was like did it look that bad it must have but yeah and um we're off onto a bunch of new I things i don't know if it's my latin ancestry but nobody ever asked me if i worked hard well, you just have that smooth. So <laughs> I have that sweaty. I'm about to panic. Look, <laughs> shall we get to the good stuff? Yep. Good day, everybody. Always pleased to be back with you. Hope all is well in your world. Quick moment from Dave and I to thank you for the overwhelming comments and kudos that we received about the Pensado Wars. It's been extraordinary. Um, props to our team for pulling it off, yep. and props to you guys. Props to you guys for kicking it off. That's where it all started. It started with you. Amen. And whatever it is that, you, that you're that you commenting on that you like is a result of your commitment to us and us wanting to hit that bar for you. So thank you. Um, one last thing on the awards I was thinking about this morning when I was doing the notes. Uh, I must say, as a connoisseur and purveyor of taste, um, you all know that for weeks I had been saying to the ladies, you know, hit it hard, turn it up, bring the heat, all that kind of stuff. Well, we must say... Ladies, you absolutely killed it. True. Didn't they? Yeah, everybody, really. I, everybody. I mean, beautiful. I got, a, I got a new damn haircut. Absolutely, you did. And, and rocking it, I must say. Yeah. Uh, but, but in particular, uh, you know, it's one thing to have an event, but ladies who are doing it right, yeah. take it to another place. You guys were beautiful, elegant. You rocked it out. It was sexy. I must say, the audio hotties were heard from that night. There's no question <laughs> about it. You all just smoked it, and again, it was a beautiful evening, and you guys made it spectacular. So we bow down, we bow down, we bow down. Now, start thinking about next year's outfit, because <laughs> oh, we are in planning mode already. You didn't learn your lesson, No, right? no, no. We're going to rock this stuff. Like and subscribe. Train is still rolling. We are peering at that 100,000 mark. It's fast approaching. Would love to bring that milestone home very soon. Most appreciated from Dave and I. Of course. Our sponsor partners are the engine of that train. Vintage King and the P team are honing down details for Gear Expo Nashville. That is going to be an absolute blast. Details coming soon. For now, mark September 27th down. Just put it in your calendar. Be there. Um, the Blackbird Academy and Blackbird Studios are going to play a very cool role in Gear Expo. Again, once we come with those details, it's going to be very cool. Um, I know we promised you last week some tape from Blackbird and another one of our sponsor partners, Slate Media. There's a travel hiccup. It stopped that only temporarily. They'll reload, and once we have the video, we'll get back to you with it. And also also details of this really serious union, right? This is a, uh, this is a powerful hookup from the things we know, right, and that we've heard. It's scary. Scary. And, and in fact, it's... Illegal in 31 states. <laughs> That's exactly right. So, but you know what? And once illegal, you get involved, it's illegal in 50 states. And that makes it really sweet. So we'll get that stuff to you. Really great stuff from great folks. Audio Technica's in the house. We got some drilling down on some of their product gear uh, coming up post haste. Plus, when we do live stuff, we get to use their 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 stuff, and mm-hmm. that's a very cool thing for us. Yeah. 
Studio 202 is actually in the building. Ron Dixon is at the helm. Big view, big thinker. DC, you're lucky to have this guy, and we are lucky to have him too. Um, Avid and Recording Connection at the ready. You know, one of the things, speaking about Avid, I thought on last week's show, um, it was really cool how Howard talked about his early adoption of, of using Pro Tools mm -hmm. in the rock space, which, mm -hmm. is, which back then was damn near courageous. Right. It was almost career suicidal. Right, 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 right. I mean, but, he had to, uh, you know, Howard's a dear friend. I've known him forever, and it was tough for him. Yeah. And, uh, but he, but he, he, he pioneered it. I mean, he definitely. Kudos to Pro Tools and, and showing how that can work. Uh, and also Recording Connection, where one-to-one -one mentoring takes place. Thanks to you all. It's just, you know, we couldn't do it without you, and we got more coming. We had been really waiting for this one for mm -hmm. a while. Actually, yeah. um, we know the management camp, and we've admired the work from afar, and we've interacted with folks in various and sundry places from where they master to sometimes where they mix. And so we've always admired this camp, and we have a key component of the camp. Welcome to our desk, Mr. Trevor Muzzy. Trevor, a lot. how are you, brother? Happy What's to up? be here. Absolutely. David, hey. fire away. Thanks, Herb. Trev, I've been, I, I've, I've kind of, been talking to our audience at various times about different ways to get into uh, the pro space in terms of mixing and engineering, and there's several paths. Describe your path, because I think that would be instructive for our guys. Yeah, my, my path's been far from typical. <laughs> Let me just start with that. Yeah. You know, I, I know a lot of guys came up interning, assisting on sessions and stuff. For me, it's been, I mean, I met, I met Red One word of mouth, friend really? of a friend kind of thing. Wow. You know what I mean? Which was which was a great, I mean, I lucked out in that way. Mm -hmm. You know, that I think luck can be a key component. And that's, that's one thing that's hard to avoid in any career. Mm -hmm. But for me, I've always been passionate about music, always been passionate about how records are made, you know, yeah. and this has been a big part for me. And so coming up when the opportunity presented itself, you know, it was, it was like being thrown into boot camp. Yeah. When I first started with him, I knew I had a lot to learn, but I was, I was thrilled to be given the chance. How many years you know? ago was that? I was actually five years ago with him. No joke. It's, yeah. It has, still hasn't been that long. No, it really hasn't. It really hasn't. How long? How far along were you in your development when you met him? Because sometimes you have to be ready for the opportunity. Absolutely. I mean, I would say I'm. I mean, where I've come since then is, is amazing. A, a quite a far, quite a far, um, quite a long way yeah, in terms sure. of my knowledge of, of everything I'm doing. But, but you were ready when it. Came I was. Up. I was ready, but I was also. I had to work very hard. You uh -huh. know. I think uh, I was talking to somebody earlier, and I said it's kind of, it's kind of like you're thrown into a situation, and you test yourself, mm -hmm. see how far you can go, and people keep testing you and see if they can push you to that, see how far they can push you, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. that's kind of what Red did with me. Mm -hmm. He kept pushing me to see how far I could go and and how I could deliver, and it just wow. worked for me, and I'm really happy about it. What's that cliche here? Uh, luck is when preparation meets opportunity, Precisely. or something. Precisely. Um, you you. Do you think, what, what, what contributions did your formal education give you in terms of a head start when you got there? Because you, you, you've got a pretty impressive formal education, not just the self-talk component, which, which is quite a bit too. Right. Well, I mean, I did go to a university, you know. Mm -hmm. It's not the, again, not the typical path for getting mm -hmm. into this, this line of work. But at the time when I went, I knew I wanted to work on music. I loved technology. I loved, I loved music technology. I wanted to be in production of mm. some sort, you mm. know. But I didn't have that direct, exact side of what I wanted. Right. I was a little uncertain. Right. And I'd always just known from an early age, maybe it's because I'm a glutton for punishment. I don't mm -hmm. know. But I knew I wanted to go and, and go as far as I could with school. Mm -hmm. And that it wasn't going to stand in the way of what I wanted to do with my career. I just... I love knowing as much as possible, yeah, you know, and, yeah. and I feel like working, everything I do, every day I'm trying to learn something. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, going through, like, like you say, a, a path like that, although it's not necessary, for me it worked. It, it kind of set me up to be in a spot where I'm, I'm almost ready for any problem that's going to come my way, you know? You know, you make an interesting point. We talk about this all the time, and we've talked about it with various people who have sat in your chair. Um, it's important to be curious, just hungry all yeah. the time. As I watch different, particularly in the arts, um, almost all the business folks that I admire, they are all preternaturally curious. 
you sit down and there's a thousand questions and they never know all the answers and they want to know and these are some of the biggest and well and it's just this drive to find that next thing and what you can do with it and I often say to our audience I think that school and that process is important no matter what you do yeah. because then you start to develop that gear and then when you apply it and focus it on music or the things that you love you're going to go farther and want to know more and does that make sense is that, do you agree with that yeah okay um, I feel better <laughs> we, we were talking a minute ago about the traditional path to a career in mixing and engineering coming through the studio system via intern to runner to right. assistant to massive wealth. And <laughs> the logical path. <laughs> of course. And, and your path, I've, I've been advocating as, for a long time as an alternate route. Now I think I'm going to advocate it as the route and the studio is the alternate route. I think your path is probably the best route right now mm -hmm. because there's a shrinking pool for interns at studios and then various legal things have shrunk that need sure. even more. Mm -hmm. Now, once you got into Team Red, Red One's camp, there were a number of producers and, and songwriters and, 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 and other in people that could engineer. Describe the camp process so that it can, you can take this fear out of it for somebody thinking, oh, I'm going to get thrown in and I got 800 bosses, which you do, but describe the process of how a typical camp works. Well, I mean, it's evolved over time a little bit with Red. Yeah. He, he's, um, when I first came in, it was, well, it was a little bit different process. It was mostly me sitting with him mm -hmm. and, and really, from my perspective, learning as much as possible, mm -hmm. you know, but from what, his, were you, what was your first job? My first, my first role with him was really coming in, cutting vocals, editing vocals, mm -hmm. um, under his guidance, of course. But guidance meaning guidance meaning they're like teaching he, guidance or teaching just? guidance, giving me feedback and all that, and, and not expecting me to deliver um, the final product on my own. But no, like, again, like I said earlier, pushing to see how far I can go on my own. It was really right. a, a trial thing. It was so it informal. It more like you know? you're being polite and that it just took him a minute to trust you. Your, your skills were there, because if you sucked, there's <laughs> a lot of people that would have wanted your job. Absolutely, and I think, you know, that's one thing that was really great about that whole situation is it kind of just worked for, for me, you know? Mm -hmm. I went in there and I, and I started working, I started doing my thing. Like I said, started out just really working with vocals for him. He'd have writing sessions with artists, uh, recording sessions, he'd sit and whether he's cutting the vocals himself or I'm cutting the vocals or however the process is going, um, I'm the one sort of at that point helping him to keep organization, keep everything together in terms of his sessions and everything. But that over time, of course, that evolved a little bit. You know, it was a couple years later that he asked me to start uh, mixing records for him. And that was, uh, you know, that was obviously a great, great. Thing, you know. Is there any is there any point in the process now? It seems like the traditional studio you're given the information and you mix it. It seems like in in Team Red or any uh, collective group of people that are under a, one strong powerful producer, you're always mixing in effect, right? I mean, yeah, like, like you're probably, you're tracking vocals and you're you're mixing then, so you're always mixing. You mix as you go, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely, and that's. I was actually just talking to somebody about this yesterday. It's like it, I have a hard time separating the roles sometimes. Right, right. If I'm cutting vocals with somebody, sometimes I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm really thinking like, okay, is this the right reverb I should be having? Is this the right compression? I'm mm -hmm. sitting there while they're tracking, listening mm -hmm. with one ear and you know, to mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. the other ear putting the mix together, you know. Mm -hmm. and like you say, it's, the lines get a little bit blurred, you know. <laughs> you said, and I like this quote, you said that I'm a, I'm a, I'm going to alter the quote because I think I can improve on it. But <laughs> traditional mixing, you, f you fix what's not good. In your style of mixing, you, you take what's good and, and make it better. You didn't say it that way. You're yeah. looking at me weird. But no. I, think, I, like, I like the way you said that. That's more or less and what I, yeah. So, 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 <laughs> so you're, you're always mixing. At what point in time, uh, when, when you start the the solo part of mixing where you can be in a room alone, are you right. still using virtual sense and, and running things live or are you at that point, everything's put into logic? You know, um, and about the logic thing, this is a question that people ask me all the time because it's, it's super interesting to mm -hmm. engineers. Like, mm -hmm. you can mix in logic? 
Is that possible? Mm -hmm. Can no, you really do possible. that? <laughs> I'll, I'll solve that right now. It's just not possible. But you do it. <laughs> I do it. And that actually, that came about, a, before I, I don't want to get too sidetracked from your question, by the way. That's, it's that's okay. a little I tangent, live in a you know? I sidetrack world. <laughs> <laughs> They're called I, parallel sidetrack yeah. world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, that's a good one, huh? I, um, I end up working in both. I end up working a lot in Pro Tools and a lot in Logic. Hmm. And like you said, it's a fast-paced process working with a team of, of different producers and songwriters. And songs, I'd say when songs come to me for me to do my part, whether it's cutting vocals or, or, or helping put together a production mix for this or helping to put together a final mix or doing a final mix, whatever, it's looking at the situation, looking at the session, seeing where the state of everything and finding the, the way that feels right to finish the song. Yeah. If the song is in a state where it's kind of in flux and it's in logic, guys are kind of, maybe Red's got an idea, he wants to do this, one of the producers wants to do this. And we'll leave things as a MIDI in logic. We'll leave things as, as notes. You know, We won't mm -hmm. commit necessarily to everything, mm -hmm. depending on the project, sure. it's, it's different. But sometimes it's really nice if you're mixing in logic to have the ability because really Red loves logic. He uses it for everything. Mm -hmm. His guys on the team are, are majority logic, logic guys. guys. Mm -hmm. So that me working in logic was really out of necessity. Yeah. Right. It wasn't necessarily by choice more than. Do you ever have a time when, when you say, you know, the bass could be a little more this, and instead of getting it with a plug in, you would just go to the, to the creator of that bass part and tell him just tweak it in logic? Yeah, absolutely. Or tweak, you know, tweak the, the synth that did it? Absolutely. It's and kind of cool, uh, isn't it? Yeah, Rhett it's, Lawrence works that way when I work with Rhett. Mm -hmm. I like that way. Yeah, it's nice to be a little flexible. Mm. On on the new J Lo album, Never Satisfied, uh, was that mix in the box? That was that was a mix in the box. Are yeah. you still using the uh, the SSL um, X Rack? You know, I have the little uh, the X Desk, X -desk yeah. exactly uh, with the Symphony I O. Um, and it, it sounds amazing. I mean, the, the Symphony I.O. is obviously a great interface. I love it. Um, but I find that over the last, over the last couple of years, I've, I've, I've been mixing a lot of records, and I've kind of gone more, more in the box. Hmm. Um, and this has really been out of necessity. Again, workflow, timelines, yeah. all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Sometimes you've got to do quick recalls on stuff, mm -hmm. and to have to, you know, one thing, it, to have to have gear that you rely on. Yeah. Outboard, I think, has been the main thing that's driven engineers to go more in the box is, mm -hmm. is the is recalls mm -hmm. and the, and people's demands, and that's definitely affected the way that I work too. And and I would assume that being in a camp, particularly a hot camp, where we were talking earlier, there's lots of things going on. You kind of have to priority mix, so there's a lot of premium on workflow solutions, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. You know, things that you can get to, count on, know it can happen, be clear about. So yeah, yeah that's got a factor. It both. enhances creativity, really. Yeah. It allows you to be creative and not worry about futzing with things. Exactly. Correct? And it, it really is great to have deadlines. I, I am one of those people. I think anybody who's a mixer um, is this way, very yeah. detail-oriented, very much like I could, I could tweak a mix forever, you mm -hmm. know? And what do they say? You don't, you don't, <laughs> you never finish the mix, you abandon it, right? <laughs> you don't, you never like, That's you never. I think That's Leonardo true. da Vinci said that to be fair to us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. If though. the Pope hadn't shut him down, he'd still be working on the Sistine Chapel. Well, that was Michelangelo, sorry. So it's good um, to have these sort of on the, on, Yeah, stop. A place to stop. On, on Never Satisfied, the, um, the vocals are spectacular, by the way. Thank you. J-Lo never sounded better. Thank you. Um, Except for maybe on the floor, which you did too. <laughs> what was your recording chain on that? On that on, record, for tracking. on Never Satisfied, that was actually, um, that was an M49 oh. into a, uh, which isn't like the rest of the album, by the way. That, that record was different. Mm. Most of the album was a C800 because it, she has one. Uh. She, she loves it. Um, I, like, I personally like the M49 better on her. Mm. I, think it's, I think it's a lot more pleasant mic for her voice. Mm -hmm. And it was, let's see, M49, 1081, CL1B. Oh, 1081? Yeah. And, and then when you got to the mix, what, what were the effects on that vocal? The vocal was, I hear like a slap delay, some kind of thing on there. What, what did you put on it? Because the effects were, the, you had to, you had to, the vocal had to fight a lot of stuff to be heard. So you, you, yeah. your effects had to be chosen very carefully. What were they? Do you remember? Um, well, I mean, 
Let's see exactly what it was. I don't mm -hmm. remember. I know vag vaguely it would have been. Uh, there was definitely some spring reverb mm. happening. Mm. Not not too strong. You hear it more on. Uh, yeah, it would have been actually the spring reverb in in guitar rig, mm. oh, which wow. is actually a pretty cool little spring yeah. reverb for for some things. Yeah. But again, not a dominant effect. Mm -hmm. um, was, it, I, was it a little bit mono? It would have been it would have been on a stereo uh, setting. Same. I don't remember if I if I steered it at all like mm -hmm. width, but it was you know that I find that's a really cool uh, spring. But that's not the only effect. There were some delays on there, some mm -hmm. throws here and there, mm -hmm. but there was also um, yeah, I, th I believe, again, I, I wish I had these specifics, but I believe it would have been a tighter slap, probably a stereo slap, yeah, Echo Boy. Like a slap. Echo Boy, no doubt. Hmm. The ooze in that verse, uh, the, the long reverb on those, what was that? The, the, the that's, that's that spring. It's, it's definitely that spring on there combined with Echo Boy. It just sat in the mix, so nice. And then, and then uh, there's certain throws that you get on words like home, and, and not, I can't remember the word in the second verse, was that the same throw that was, except that was on the ooze? Did you use it as a throw on those? I believe it would have been the same. If not, a copied, you know, basically the t similar type of settings. I, I really like for throws, uh, either H Delay or Echo Boy. Mm -hmm. They just quick and get the job done. Have a lot of colors you can play with. Did you did you have any problems? Because I have what like I I I have this adverse reaction when the vocal's the only bright thing in the mix and she's the only bright thing in the mix that has anything above six in it. How did you do that? Because normally I would make the, the vocal kind of match the hi-hat a little more. Mm -hmm. How did you approach that? I thought that was really a great way to do it because the track has a vibey thing to it, but she, ain't, she has a class to her. That, and that, that's kind of the thing is that that track it really is such a vibey track. Right. And actually, I had a couple of approaches to that mix. That wasn't the first iteration, how it oh, ended up. Cool. The first iteration had her a little more, I'd say, in the mix. Mm -hmm. You know, like, mm -hmm. and like you say, she's out front. And she really wanted that. That was, that was her idea, uh -huh. to have herself very out front, very dominant. Mm -hmm. And it's almost like I'd bring, her, I'd bring her a mix, play it for her, and she'd listen. She'd say, I love it. I love everything. But but I should be more out front. Uh -huh. and, and, you know, you, sometimes you fight your, your urge to say it should be a little more of this. And you say, oh, let's try it, of course. And you right. do it. And it actually did something really cool mm -hmm. where she's, she's out front. You know, the track is kind of just providing this cool bed for her. And, and yeah. she's just, like you say, out front and kind of the dominant thing in the oh, whole cool. I always track. liked uh, Michael Jackson's approach. He said, I don't want people to listen to my vocals. I want them to dance. So... It, mm -hmm. uh, the mix I just recently did, I, I tried to be respectful, but I put him a little louder than he would have liked. But when you listen to his classic mixes, he's tucked in, but boy, the grooves are like, you know, make up for that. Yeah. You and I do the same thing we were talking earlier. Like, I like to listen to the last, the last hit in the mix because it tells me the decay of the snare, mm -hmm. what, and then I can p figure out what, what, decay, what the reverb was. Mm -hmm. And so... The, the, the last little snare hit has this nice reverb on it. What was that reverb? Oh, yeah, the little, like, woodblocky yeah, kind of snare thing. Bobby, yeah, Bobby. It's, um, that was actually one of the Logic reverbs. Logic has some, has some pretty cool reverbs in them, and they're, I wouldn't call them high fidelity by any means. I wouldn't call mm -hmm. them, you know, <laughs> game-changing by any means. Right. It, while it has some nice ones, it also has some that are just really specialized and really vibey you mm -hmm. know and, and and i've seen guys use them to really cool effect that effect was in there um mm -hmm. in the track and my instinct in mix was to say that is such a cool sound Maybe why are we why are we cutting it off you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's just it's such a cool sound yeah, hearing the tail the reverb like that is such a haunting way to end the song mm -hmm. you know those mm -hmm. little details are mm -hmm. and another trick that i learned from my friend dexter simmons you can take one of those uh pieces of equipment that, that allows you to take the vocal out of a song so you can sing along right. with it. What they really do is some phase things, herbs, herb, herbs, herbs, good see herbs. Sure. And, but, but when you do that on a mix and take the vocal out, you're left with the effects for the vocal. So you can hear the effects on the vocal without the vocal being there. Mm. I, I thought that was a cool thing. I don't know why I, I, don't know why I tossed that in. Cool. Um, on, on Nicki Minaj Starship, a neat thing happened. Uh, my buddy Aris Shobaz had, an, had, an, had a vocal chain, and then you were uh, 
recording that vocal. Yeah. Uh, explain to me how that vocal was recorded on Starship with Nikki. Yeah, well, I walked into the studio to record a few songs with Nikki for, for Red. Um, and Ariel was there. He'd been working with her on some other songs. Mm -hmm. And so they had a setup going that was working for them. The first thing I said is, I'm not going to walk in and just disrupt your flow and sure. say, oh, no, this is the mic we're using. This is the, you know, start making demands for no mm -hmm. reason. I said, what have you been using? And he said, oh, he was super cool about it. He said, we got these two chains. You know, one was a, one was a 251 and sort of less, less traditional preamp chain. I think it was a Chandler. Uh, 251 on one, and then the other was uh, was an M49 actually mm. with a more with 1081 CL1B, which is yeah. I'd say like actually mirrors what, what on the JLo song. Which one did you end up choosing? The 251. Um, the more, more the more let's call it more modern chain. Yeah, and and why was that? What's what 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 was it? What what? If I say what again, just slap me. <laughs> just using what I did earlier. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's wearing off. Okay. Cool. What caught your ear that made you feel that the newer chain sounded better when the other chain was probably a more traditional approach? I'd, I'd like to know what, what you heard that, that you said, oh, that's better. Well, honestly, as soon as she got behind the mic and started going, we knew it was, I knew it was right. You know, the track is, is I wouldn't say it's a, a lush track like the way we talked about Never Satisfied. It's, right. a, it's a, a lot of aggressive sounds, a lot of things in your face, mm -hmm. and her voice needs to compete with that. And the 251 gave her a little bit of edge that was helping it cut, you know? And for me, it was just staying away from anything that was gonna give her a lush vocal sound. It's not such a singy song as mm -hmm. much as it is more, you know, more aggressive in your face a little right. bit. So. That song has a combination of singing and rapping. Mm. Did, how, what was the difference in the way you treated both of those in the same song? You couldn't just let the same effects and oh, EQ no. run. What Absolutely was, not. What, 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 Take me through your philosophy on how you did it differently to, to enhance both to the best they could be. Well, I mean, Nikki's vocal, I mean, she's, she's a, an amazing rapper. Mm -hmm. She gets behind the mic and she goes and she knows exactly what she wants mm -hmm. and she does it. And to me, you kind of just follow what she did and it, it guides you where you want to be, at least mm -hmm. in, my, to, in my experience. For her rap, the goal was to get it as tight as possible. You know, you're not going to put as much you're not going to go for a lush vocal sound for an, an aggressive, fast right, rap. Right. Like, the chorus is meant to be a big chorus. Obviously, there's stacks of vocals going on. It's not just a voice. Mm -hmm. um, her verse is a lot tighter, a lot faster. And really, just everything you can do between uh, EQ compression effects to emphasize the fastness of the verse mm -hmm. and the tightness of it and make the words bite a little bit, as opposed to the chorus being a little more open and lush, you know? Can, can I expound on or just I've, I'm curious about. So in that particular song, between how you treat the vocals and how you treat the rap, causes different philosophies that you have to sort of work out in your head. Does that, does that apply also being in a camp when you're around producers and songwriters and you know a songwriter may have an intention for a song and you might know it early where they're going and does that affect once it's time to mix kind of, do you have more information that would affect how you'd approach a mix by being in a camp and knowing what people want to do or do you, stay sort of devoid of that and be fresh when the material comes to you? That's actually a great question, because... Um, Excellent question. Great Thank question, you. yeah. A lot, of, a lot of times, um, <laughs> you know, I mean, with pop music, the way that it's a little, or that it's pretty unique, is yeah. that it does have some what you call formulas and some things that you don't try and change. You don't, you don't right. fix it if don't it ain't broke kind right. of thing, that's, you that's know? Right. Yep. And uh, when it comes to for example, the chorus in that song. Mm -hmm. I knew that I was gonna do a, like a kind of standard stereo delay on her vocal, that it would be there, mm -hmm. just because of the vibe that we like wanted quarter, to have. Thing? Eighth quarter, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, which, which just gives a sort of feeling, even if people don't know they're hearing it, they're used to hearing it as quite a, a common treatment. Right, right. And that kind of thing, just knowing like, knowing like uh, what you would have done in the past yeah. helps you to get quickly where you would go on something yeah. you're working on yeah. you know? yeah. uh, speaking of, of of echoes i noticed on that song you didn't let the repeats go much past a quarter note that was uh, to keep it tight in the in the chorus you're talking about yeah, yeah. 
Well, the course went a little longer, but the but you had a little tight delay on her rap at some spots, but it didn't go. That 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 went that that. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah, and I think again the the delays would have been treated the same way, you know. So they can be there and be felt, but without getting in the way of her vocal. Right. The, you know, the the delays that were on there weren't weren't like in your face effect kind of delays. They were more just creating a the, the space for her mm -hmm. vocal to live in. So mm -hmm. it wasn't the goal wasn't for them to be to get attention, you know, to take attention away from her vocal. In the camp, um, from what I know, that you, there's a the palette is pretty wide in terms of the type of acts, the type of music. The internationalization of the artist. There's a. Does that keep you fresh and allow you to just work on different things and be stimulated? Because there's there's pop records and there's records that apply to other countries. Is that a good thing? Yeah, it, thing? it's really interesting. It's been insightful working on on a number of projects. You know, I, to be ex, to to be in a situation where you're cutting vocals in in French. Yeah. And randomly, you're expected to. Give give the singer feedback, you know. Here you go. Like, uh, is this good or not? Uh, a little bit more of the uh, this, you know, whatever, you know. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, you know, I don't, I, I don't speak, I don't speak these languages, you know. Because our French audience. <laughs> yeah. But it's, you know, having, having said that, like, working with people outside and, and other countries, it's it's really cool getting a different perspective and knowing this song is kind of gonna do something in France that it won't do here, you know, or, yeah. or in Spanish or yeah. whatever. And, and it's cool to be in a, in a spot where you get to do that. One of the things I like about, uh, I'm sorry to cut you off. One of the things I like about Red One's taste is, given his background, he just doesn't seem to have limitations on what, he's looking for good, he's looking for great, Absolutely. actually. And great can come from any place. It's not Absolutely. great just here, it can yeah. be, right? Is that, is that a fair? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah and I'm, he is, I'm, he I'm, really I'm, is a, a global, you know, dude. global guy. You yeah. know? He's, He's, he's not, I wouldn't say he's aiming for any one particular market. He, li he likes to do songs that he likes to do. Well, tell, tell Red when you say that with you here, that takes about 30 countries. And if he comes, we'll get the other 120. So he, he <laughs> tell him he has, he has no choice. But no, I'm just, I'm, I digress. Following on the, not that last thread, but thread before that, mm -hmm. uh, I guess I guess the, the 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 influences of Sweden, you your camp has a lot of Swedish influences, obviously, mm -hmm. and um, you guys aren't afraid to throw a guitar in anywhere, which I love. <laughs> and and what, what was Carl Car Car Falk? Is that yeah. the guy's name that played guitar on that song? Absolutely. Man, what a great sound! It almost reminds me. A lot of people are gonna hate me for this, but. It reminds me of a classic uh, Pink Floyd kind of affected guitar. Did you record that or did no? I didn't. No, Carl would have done it himself. On that. See, see, guitar players. That's what's great about us is we do that for it for the. <laughs> You're so gracious. Guitar oh players. no, guitar players. Of course. <laughs> we we are the we are the best musicians in the audio space. Oh, okay, and and the most humble. Well, no, I mean, you know, if, if Michael Jordan says I'm the greatest basketball player, would you call that arrogance? No, I, no. I would, well, there I you would go. Look at his thing. Yeah. There you go. And that, that sums question. it all up. <laughs> <laughs> in two <laughs> seconds, you're going to loosen your arm for batter's box. We'll throw another one in so we can see your okay. humility. Speaking of vocals. All right. Um, a, a lot of times I hear people use um, decapitator, other other. Let's call them bit crushers, like the EDM guys do, and and they they don't always do it well. Decapitator is one of my favorite plugins, but but you used a bit crusher on on, on Nikki's vocals. Explain to people how you used it to enhance the sound, not alter it. It's it's really well done. Thank you. It's this is uh, this is actually a good example of a vocal that you're trying to get to not just be out front, but also live in the same space as everything else in the track. Uh -huh. And there's from those guitars to mm -hmm. some of the synths, there's bit crushing going on on a lot of the sounds in that mix to kind of give you that lo-fi, but but it gives you a kind of clarity in a way. It throws away some information, right? Mm -hmm. A kind yeah. of yeah. So when you're when you're when you're when you're changing the bit rate, what what are you listening for? Are you listening? Inside the track, not soloed, and, and when it starts sitting in the track, you know you're done. Is that what a lot of people are not doing correctly then, where they're listening in solo mode? 
maybe? I mean, I guess the best, is, best thing is always trust your ears. I mean, I don't know if there's a rule for, that I could quote, you know, but on, on that vocal, it didn't have a bit crusher just on the vocal. It would have been parallel. in parallel. Oh, and, okay. and, and so just, and probably narrowed in, in frequency range. So it's really just affecting From what, the what vocal range. I don't remember exactly. It would have been some type, some type of uh, telephony cue oh, okay. type of thing, just r narrowing it around the the the, up, the mid upper mid vocal range. Three yeah. to three k, three hundred. Yeah, 3K maybe. exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. Something around there. And one last question. Uh, get in a little bit of a plug for our guy Steve Duda. How did you use his his uh, Xfer LFO tool? I noticed that you used that. Yeah, that was on. That was one of the examples of a plugin that was in the session, I think on like one track, and then oh. when we were finally done, it was on more than just one track. It, it, was, it was around in there, but it was, um, it's a really cool plugin. You know, you can sidechain, you can create like uh, more LFO, non-traditional um, curves, you know, for your, for your sidechain type effect, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just following a kick or keying off of some other sound in the mix. You can actually do some different shapes that are kind of cool. And uh, I, I, I forgot to mention um, um, Beat Geek. I love his work, so if it, I don't know the man, but just the, just say hello to him. And say, Absolutely. man, you got a fan over there. Absolutely. I love his work. Loosen yeah. up your arm there, I'm Mr. Ready. Kitcher. Oh, man. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't need to. I don't, I don't need to. You don't need to loosen no. the liniment? No. I got, I got it. I got this one. Oh, the, you know what? The balls are in your core. Yeah, hey, Chum, you? call Mix Magazine. Get ready. Fire it uh, away. <laughs> accordion. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> accordion. <laughs> that's, actually, that's actually a fair question. There you go. <laughs> okay, go question. for it. And the answer would be? Um... A CL1B. Nice. <laughs> oh, okay. He, he pulled On the floor back. had accordion. There was an accordion in the main melody of the song. Love it. No joke. Yeah. Like the one with the buttons or the oh, one yeah. with the keys or like the one with just buttons? Yeah, keys like traditional. I don't even know what the difference is. Like, like a Lawrence Welk accordion? You don't like even a full size? Welk, yeah. yeah, sure I do. My, you know. Come on, man. It's music, music people. <laughs> Fire <laughs> Lawrence Welk. Lawrence, Lawrence Welk show. Lawrence hip hop. You guys look it up. <laughs> <laughs> this ought to be funny next week. Oh, the letters. <laughs> Synth. Um, sausage fattener. Ooh, da da. DSer. Waves standard DSer, not R DSer, the other one. Mm. The gray one? Yeah. Cool. Clarity. Ooh. I'm going for it. Right? Clarity. Um, C1 comp in upward mode. Bastard. Ooh. Guitars. Um, the Trident EQ. Mm. Island plug-in. You know what? Let me. I, I said that incorrectly. Island gear. Plug-ins. Fair plug enough. Uh, do, you can't say laptop. You can't yeah, say. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. I like that. Laptop. Yeah. I like that. But Mac, don't say MacBook that. Pro. All right. No. <laughs> Stereo bus. Um, Vintage warmer, Ooh. PSP, reverb. I'm really loving the new, um, the new native, uh, 24 and 48 emulations. Oh, cool, cool. Kick drums. Either, well, it sounds. Quick two-part answer, fast. Sure. Um, Pultec. EQ, mm -hmm. if it's a sound that just needs a little little bit of help, a little bit more extreme, um, L316. I'll accept that. Good job. And then your instrument of choice, the one that you play so masterfully, bass. Bass. Mm -hmm. um, LA3A. That was Son of a bitch. Not to say. It was both domestic. I knew, I knew when he got accordion, I was in trouble. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it started out bad and went from there. But you know what? You did good. I have to give you credit. Thanks, He's my some, friend. Um, he just was. It's about time you took my side on one of these. I? You're 0 for six, 160. I know, 177 or whatever. <laughs> but his bat speed was pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. And, and, and 
I like the way he just kind of took control of the whole thing. But he was so calm. There was kind of an assassin kind of thing about it, you know, and just, know. yeah, very calm. And, and before know. you know it, your juggler's, you know, bleeding out. So, uh, well, let's continue this assassination and introduce Chong Gorgant. He's in our uh, corner office. Chong Gore, how are Chong-Gor. you, sir? Doing pretty good, guys. How are you? We're good, man. We are, uh, you got some questions for our, for our guy over there? Yeah, we do. This first one's from uh, Alvaro Moreno. Do you ever find yourself overdoing a mix, and is there a mental checklist you go through to know when you're finished? You don't stop. What you a great question. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's, it is easy to go too far, mm-hmm. and, and sometimes it takes somebody else walking into the room to tell you that Whoa. and say, you know, it's, this isn't as good as the demo. Right. And you take a step back and you listen, and the greatest thing about that to me is once you've gone through a mix and you've, you've made a mix, you kind of know the landscape and you know all the elements and what you got to work with. Right. And if you go back to the demo, if you have gotten a little lost along the way, even if it's just a day or two, mm-hmm. you get a little bit lost, you can go back to the demo, hear the vibe, hear what somebody might be missing, what was there that was good, mm-hmm. and quickly, I mean, within an hour, sure to get right you. back to that. You know? Shango, can I have your permission to talk for a second? Yeah. <laughs> Let me share something with you. My technique is when they walk in and say that, go, this is the demo. <laughs> Let me play you the demo. <laughs> Let me play you my mix and then play the demo. Yeah. Try that one time. Nice. Chongor, give us another. This next one's from Chris Garner. When you're mixing synthesizers, what's going through your mind as you bring up the faders? And which reverb types do you find to favor synthesizers? That's a hard question. Yeah. I mean, synths, synths are, in, in pop music and dance music, there it could be almost anything. You know. It, it's 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 a hard question because some synths are almost bases. Some Let me synths narrow it down. are. Uh, Chris, if I can, if if you'll give me this, uh, answer the question uh, vis-a-vis classic dance, uh, that buzzy pad that's so ubiquitous. Right. Like that word. Mm-hmm. Great. Uh, well, I mean, once the drums and the vocals are sitting together, the way a way that feels good to me. Mm-hmm. The idea is having the synths in there in in. In pop music, the synths are usually not there just to kind of fill in the holes. In my experience, they're there so they can be heard. Mm. You know, and more often than not, some styles of music lend themselves well to having strong drum and vocal mix where the synths can kind of sit in the back seat. Right. Sometimes, this is different for depending on the style, the synths need to be up in your face. And it's about finding that balance where the synths can be as loud as possible in the right stereo space with the vocals, so you still feel them. Do you put effects on your synth? Absolutely, and a lot of synths uh, that come to me are already affected in some way, printed with reverbs and delays and all kinds of stuff going Mm -hmm. on, and so sometimes adding much to that can be out of control. You ever ask to have some of that removed? Yeah, and this is one cool thing about if I've gotten the session with stuff not printed. Oh, okay. You know, because mm-hmm. then you can go back. Sometimes if somebody sends a session and they're using Nexus or something as a, as a synth, and you say, man, that, that synth is pretty wet. Right. <laughs> you can open it and, and dial it back right there. That's mm-hmm. your job as part of the camp. Huh? You know? Mm-hmm. So, and since that is just affecting the mix, you know, I'm not going through and, and changing people's sounds like Thanks, that. Thanks, Chris. You know what? Um, one of the things, the hallmark of doing this show a lot, is that when it's going really good, it goes really fast. <laughs> so here's here's the problem you have with us. We have only scratched the surface. You, you've you got to promise that you'll come back, will you? I would love to. We, is, uh, is it possible, I'm gonna put you on the spot, is it possible like, for you to just take your iPhone and just go around and show us what a camp looks like? Or is that, would you get fired for that? Yeah, you'd be in trouble. <laughs> and, and I wouldn't let I wouldn't it happen. What does the camp too. look like? Well, we'll go over and shoot. Well, we'll get some permission and come over and visit you in the studio at some point in time. All we'll right. make it more official. But honestly, Trevor, I think that yeah. um, the point of view you have, people don't know about how those camps can work. And, and also, I think what's also fascinating is to be able to show what a really high-level camp. With, because people, under, they, they see all the glamour and the money and the other stuff. They don't understand the pressures and the expectations and... It comes with a lot of that. Right. Lots of committee, lots of people worried, lots of pressure, a lot of artists, a lot of Absolutely. managers. It's a lot of stuff. So it's a fascinating concept because I think it's more and more what when you get to this level yeah. you should be able to expect. So you, we will be able to grace, you'll grace our desk again? I would love to come back. Man, what a pleasure.
First Amendment. The pleasure's all mine. Dave, take us home. No, no okay. I'm trying to formulate this this in my in my mind because I've I've avoided camps my whole life, and I don't I don't want this to come off the wrong way. I want to be careful and articulate this in a respectful way. I think the world today is probably that we're inheriting as audio engineers. You're better served to try and get in a camp. Now, there's one negative thing about a camp, and that's you don't get to work for other people. So if that camp goes away, it, you don't have a, a clientele base because you essentially only had one client, right, Trevor? Yeah, that's how, I, I, yeah. how, do you, how do you deal with that? I mean, do you ever think about maybe I need to work for some other people just in case Red One decides to retire tomorrow? I mean, I guess, yeah, it's, it, it can always be, you know, you, you never know exactly what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. You know, you never do. And it's, it's, it's built in job security. But you got to pay attention to that concept a little bit. I'm a big, I'm a big proponent of the camps, and, and one of the reasons that Herb and I asked Trevor to be on the show today is because he exemplifies everything good about a camp, and the Red One camp is as good as it gets. All right, guys, one quick thing. If you need something in the northern part of Atlanta, check out my buddy uh, Harry O'Brien at Atlanta Recording. His story is uh, incredible. He, he got dealt some bad cards, and he's turned it into a studio. So. Check him out for me, and we'll see you next week.